yeah, let's talk a bit about the expectations around the course project. I really want you to work in groups on something that's meaningful to you, that you think is interesting, that you think is worth doing. And I think it's a great chance for you to apply machine learning here and something that you can really show to others that you can be proud of, that you can show in applications regardless of whether you want to go into the industry or want to stay in academia. So that's why it's really important for me to do this course project. And I'm going to show you also the exciting stuff that has happened in other data science courses that I've taught so far. So I have some proof of uh, proof that this works and that this actually is fun. Let's first consider the grading criteria again you see that your grade mainly depends on these three things. One is the report on fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics and machine learning. Uh, and the other two things, and that's 80% of your grade, are the final presentation and the final report. And you can see that the majority of the things that you're going to do in this class are related to the course project. We have an expose presentation, we have a progress presentation, we have a final presentation and the final report. And they make up the majority of your grade. So it's worth investing a lot of time. The idea is that you as a group of three plus minus one people will work on a project throughout the course, applying the things that you see. Because again, I said this in other videos, I think it really, really comes down in doing it yourself and actually applying the different things so that you learn them. Because that will both give you the interest to actually go in under the hood and really understand how the algorithms work and will help you to really combine the knowledge and really have skills that you can use in your future. So what I want you to do is really to pick a data set that you're interested in Pick a research question that you think is relevant and then pick a suitable method. And as I said before, you find the best, whatever best is, and you define that largely. You find the best model for your data set, for your question and your method. And then you're going to write a report on the findings in which you motivate the choices and, of course, explain the different results. So let's look at the past projects in this course and how exciting they were. So last year, for instance, there was a group who trained an AI to predict the results for the German card game Doppelkopf. We had students who explored recipes and visualized them depending on the cuisine and the proximity of the ingredients. So very interesting question, really something they were interested in, like how do these different cuisines relate? How do they um yeah, how are they connected to each other? And then they explored this based on recipes they found online. We had a group that made a beach or not beach classifier, which basically took in pictures of beach scenes and then predicted whether this was a beach or not. Another really nice project from the past was a group that tried to understand how and which issues are prevalent with which airlines. So they downloaded and scraped a lot of customer reviews about different airlines and then built a machine learning model to analyze this data to find problems that are common with the different airlines. Very exciting. Another nice project that I liked very much in the past was about choosing the right emoji. You might know this if you type on your phone and you type in uh, beer, it will show you a beer emoji. Uh, so here the question was to find emojis, not just on the level of individual words, but on the level of sentences and to predict them based on a sentence. And they did a very, very nice analysis in that regard. Here's another nice project from the past in which a group uh, scraped almost 300,000 articles from a German news out, uh, outlet uh, based on 11 categories and then found a system generated like and then developed a system to automatically classify different articles based on genre. They also looked at the different topics that were discussed in a different genre. Very exciting. 
Another group worked on music using the Spotify API and they tried to classify music into different genre based on information such as instrumentalness, danceability and the valency of the music. Another project analyzed social media topics in regard to terror. So they did topic modeling on a very, very large number of Reddit comments and investigated different terrorist attacks um, and analyzed the topics that are most commonly discussed in the context of such attacks. So a very, very broad range of things that have been done. Um, let's also consider some other things that you could be doing, some data sets that I find um, are interesting and big. Here's, for instance, the so-called phishing websites data set. So we have information about phishing websites that try to scam people. And you can use this to, you can analyze this in a variety of way, either to classify whether a website is phishing related or not, or many, many other ways. There's also a lot of data on stock recommendations, right? Which stocks on the Wall Street uh, will perform well or will perform not so well. This can be very nicely combined with other kinds of data. Here's also a very nice data set that I've used in my research before. It's the Open University Learning Analytics data set. Uh, and here we have the data from people who use a learning analytics platform and whether they fail a course or not. And a lot can be done here on how people learn, when they learn, and who um, struggles with classes and who doesn't. Very, very nice. If you're into music, you can take, for instance, these chorales from Bach uh, and analyze them, maybe even generate music. Yeah, we also have uh, a bachelor thesis in our group that's focused on exactly that. And uh, overall, the UCI machine learning repository is a very, very good starting point to get a feeling about what data exists, what data can be selected. You can use the data. You just have to cite it and, and be clear which data you took and where, and then you can use that data. That's no problem uh, for your own projects. Here's also another one that I found quite cool. If you're into comics, here's a 120 gigabyte data set of comics and the the writings, maybe there's something interesting to be done there. And here's a huge list of different data sets collected by this blog called Data is Plural. Just follow the link uh, on the shortened, the shortened link there on top and you find a huge amount of data that's out there. That said, I think it's also really cool and worth considering to generate your own data set. It's really not that hard. It gives you a lot more creative, like room for creativity. You can have very, very different questions. And a lot of the cool projects that I showed you from the course from the past were actually people who generated their own data set. One thing that you need for that is the so-called web scraping. In its most simplest form, you just want to mirror a website and you can use this command line tool called wget with the option mirror. So here are the different options and give it any URL and we'll download all the files related to the, the URL. So just make a perfect copy. The important thing here is to ask for permission. Please don't just download anything. Ask the people, tell them this is a student project, um, tell them what the scope of the project is and then ask them for permission. I think that's very important to me. Please do that. If you want to talk to the web and if you have permission, then you can use the Python library requests to download and open almost any website, just like you do in a web browser. So you just do request.get, for instance, uni-bremen.de, uh, minus bremen.de, and then you can get the content of the website or the HTML. There's also Python libraries like Beautiful Soup to then pass the HTML and just get the data that you need for your research project. So the simplest form is just downloading everything as HTML or writing a Python script that visits a website. Sometimes 
especially more popular websites, also have application programming interfaces that you can use to get data. He and these websites usually use a standard called JSON. JSON is the JavaScript object serialization standard. Uh, and it's basically a dictionary, like you know from Python now, like what we call a hash in Python or a dictionary in Python. Um, and it's just a structured way of uh, um, representing data. And you can use the library JSON in combination with the request library to make a request to the API. You just need to look at the documentation. Usually they have some good examples on how to use it. And then you can get the data in a structured format so that you can work with it. An alternative to JSON would be XML. That's another way of marking up data, of representing data, and you can use that to um, communicate with different servers and uh, to exchange data in a structured way. If that doesn't work, and if you have permission to use the website, especially for websites that have a lot of JavaScript, you can also use Selenium. Selenium is a Python library that's mostly used for web testing, and you can use it to remote control any browser. So what we do here in the Python code, and that's actually code that you can run, we start Firefox, and then we have a list of URLs, and we take these URLs, we open them in the browser, and save them, save the source, the page source of the website that's currently opened in Firefox, save that to a file, and then we sleep for a random amount of time. Especially for websites like Facebook, uh, which are JavaScript heavy and which don't really work so well if you open them with wget. This is uh, a way to uh, gather a lot of data. I use this, for instance, to gather a lot of fake news uh, that I then analyze. And yeah, that's it for the web scraping. Thank you very much and have a good day.